I'm George Chidi, and we're here at the National Center for Civil and Human Rights. Welcome to The Next Atlanta. There's no doubt our city is a place of diversity and progressive ideas, but oppression and racism still exist. And the only way we're gonna see real change here and throughout the nation is if we talk about it openly. Today, the mass incarceration of black people in America. We're talking to experts about its effect on our society and the legislation that could actually help people once they're released. We also discussed this issue with someone who's actually been convicted of a crime. She says the stigma of that criminal record is making it hard for her to live as a free woman. Finally, a topic that's ever present in the South, Confederate monuments. To some, they're important historical markers, but to others, they're reminders of the bondage forced on so many of our ancestors and proof that racist institutions still exist today. That's coming up on the next Atlanta. I'm George Chidi, and this is The Next Atlanta. I'm here at the National Center for Civil and Human Rights. I'm also here virtually on Zoom with Tiffany Roberts. Tiffany is from the Southern Center for Human Rights. And Tiffany, tell us about yourself. Thanks for having me. Um, I am a criminal defense and civil rights attorney. But I'm also an organizer. So I've been working in Atlanta for just a little over a decade around police accountability and state violence and my role at Southern Center is to build bridges between grass tops organizations, grassroots organizations, and other stakeholders to bring about meaningful change in the criminal legal reform space. One of the things that you're working on is reform at the city jail. There's a movement to repurpose it for something else. Can you give us a bit of the background and what you're, what you're looking at there? Marilyn Wynn, who is the founder of Women on the Rise, which is an organization entirely led by formerly incarcerated Black women, launched uh, the Close ACDC campaign years ago. It was actually launched during the Reed administration. But when Mayor Bottoms took office, she was willing to give an audience to community organizations who wanted to invest the city's dollars, um, not in incarceration, but in services and resources. And so uh, the mayor launched the Reimagining ACDC Task Force in partnership with Women on the Rise and Racial, Ju Racial Justice Action Center. And our task over the last year, up until February of 2020, was to think about what could happen to the building, what programs and services could be available in the building, and what kinds of policy changes would be necessary in the city um, to make jail closure feasible. So right now, the mayor is, we're waiting on the mayor's final decision about what she will do with the jail, but we're hoping that we can decriminalize most of our city code and think about ways to make better use of programs like pre-arrest diversion and non-emergency, non-law enforcement responses to emergencies. So let me ask a straight up question. Why close the jail? We don't need it. We don't need the jail. It was built in the wake of the 96 Olympic Games. It was intended to be a place where we could hide Atlanta's poor, Atlanta's homeless. It was essentially a way to sweep the streets of people who tourists don't like to look at and put them in a building. And so what's important to know is that since bail reform passed in Atlanta, the jail is employing more people than it actually, than it actually incarcerates. Um, numbers have been even as low as like single digits in 10 at the jail since bail reform. And so um, no one needs to spend $33 million, especially in the middle of a pandemic that has so many cities financially strained when money could be going to providing relief to families and individuals who need um, resources. Glad you brought up the pandemic because I expect that changes the way people are looking at this jail and jail in general. Well, not only are jails hotbeds for, um, for the passage of COVID-19, right? If, if not handled properly, jails become hotspots quickly because people cannot socially distance in jail. Um, and beyond that, um, now is not the time when people who are already separated from their families because of illness um, further separated because they're stuck in a cage. And so on top of that, there are so many things that we need to be spending our money on. What do you want to see happen soon? I would like for the jail to be closed soon. 
I would like for the um, petitions of people from Women on the Rise and Racial Justice Action Center, Southerners on the Ground and others to be heard by the city. Um, I believe that many of us served faithfully because we know that Mayor Bottoms really um, intends for this to be a new Atlanta. And for that to happen, one promise has to be, one at least one promise has to be kept, and that's the promise to shut down the city jail. I can't help but notice that the legislature just took a whack at bail reform this year. Like, even though we're passing a hate crimes bill, that looked like an attack on the bail reforms that Atlanta had started. Am I misreading that? You're not misreading that. What's important to note though, George, is that this is the third or fourth consecutive year that the bail industry has attempted to undermine either the possibility of bail reform or the reality of it. So every for, for several legislative sessions, community organizations have shown up to the General Assembly to kill bills that would have basically preempted bail reform in the city of Atlanta and the city of Athens and kept other um, local legislatures from enacting similar laws. What we saw through, um, I think it's Senate Bill 402, uh, was the, uh, the legislature deciding that signature bonds are illegal. And so what the bonds that come out of the city of Atlanta's bail reform aren't technically signature bonds. There were cognizance bonds and there's not a monetary amount attached to them. But for many people, judges are, are will allow them to be released from jail without paying money on a contingency. So that means if a judge says you have a $10,000 signature bond in the state of Georgia, that means you don't have to pay money to get out. But if you fail to appear, um, you will, your bond will convert to a regular surety bond and you'll have to either go through a bail bondsman for that $20,000 or pay it to the court or pay it to the sheriff. We know that uh, many, many people who are charged with things beyond ordinance violations and traffic citations get signature bonds in Georgia. Um, and now we will see uh, many more people, if the governor decides to sign this bill, we will see many more people jailed simply because they don't have money because the legislature chose to take a tool out of judges' toolboxes um, despite testimony from a judge at the, at the state assembly saying that judges do not want for signature bonds to be eliminated. Of all the things that are coming out of the protests, the ideas that are starting to percolate up from the street, the jail is one of them. Are there other ideas that you think people should be looking at now? People should pay attention to cities around the country that are reallocating resources away from law enforcement and to services. So when we look at Women on the Rise's ACDC closure campaign, the name of the campaign wasn't to defund the police, right? But the idea was still there. Divest from carceral systems, invest in resources. And so in addition to uh, shutting down jails that we don't need, we should be thinking about non-law law enforcement responses to emergencies. We know that many, many people are jailed on a daily basis because they have an unmet mental health need. And when you couple that with hostile law enforcement that believes that it is at war with this community, you will see more and more people who have unmet mental health needs unmet substance abuse needs, you will see them jailed disproportionately and unable to get out. And so um, there is a program called CAHOOTS um, in some cities, I believe in Seattle maybe, um, where non-law non enforcement emergency staff can report to crises that don't require someone to be armed in order to assist the community. And so I think that cities need to really think about the function of law enforcement. We hear all the time people say, police aren't social workers. And you know what, they're absolutely right. And so in situations where social workers and medical professionals should be responding to the scene, we need to allocate important resources to those solutions instead of doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result. This is the feedback that we needed. I think people are gonna take away from this things that are important. I'm incredibly grateful for your time. Uh, I'm incredibly grateful that you've been able to meet with us here on Zoom and, and tell people what's going on. Um, thank you very much. Thank you for having me. I'm George Chidi. This is The Next Atlanta. I'm here at the National Center for Civil and Human Rights with Elida McClendon, 
Uh, Elida is uh, living in Atlanta and um, has had trouble with housing. Um, and I'd like her to tell us about herself. Elida, and thank you for being here. Thank you, George. You were telling me before that you lost your house in a fire? Yes. Uh, last year? Yes. This was uh, the end of December 2019. Tell me about how your um, criminal record has impacted your ability to find housing. You would be surprised that having a simple misdemeanor on your record um, can prevent you from not just um, having uh, the bare necessities with employment. I've spent numerous of dollars, time, um, and efforts trying to rehouse my family since December of 2019. Um, when it comes to having anything on your background that is not removed. It doesn't matter how new or how old, um, it's still a factor. And it is considered to be um, kind of like a black mark on your application already. How many applications have you made? <laughs> Since December of 2019, Since December. I can definitively say I've applied for over 10 properties and I have been told by at least three of them um, that my background or my fiance's background, uh, for whatever reason, they wouldn't even rent to us. You are almost deemed to being financially incompetent and homeless at this point. The thing I'm looking at right now is about what happens when a criminal record is expunged. Mm -hmm. Like, what would that mean for you? Hmm. Um, having a expungement of um, a criminal background opens a lot of doors for me and my family um, with better employment, with um, better choices for housing. I've been told that I need to look smaller or try and find private owners um, because of my background or because of the lack thereof. Um, and simply being able to um, express to the courts, you know, the case is completed, everything has been finalized. You know, how can I redeem myself from this? Is there a way? And they tell you yes, but you have to file proceedings if you're not an attorney, if you don't have the money. So again, if you're able to just speak on your own behalf, I'm a better person, I'm a different person and I deserve to be able to prove that, and I can't with having this beauty mark, so to speak, on my background. There's so many people that have had things take place in their lives that were, whether it was in their control or out of their control, but it impacts their life. And there's no way that I can provide what I need to provide to my children so that they can be successful when I'm not allowed to be successful. Elida, you've been brave, and I'm incredibly grateful. You're exactly what we needed. I'm glad you were able to come here and tell us about your, so your story. Well, thank you. I do appreciate being able to talk about it. George Chidi, this is The Next Atlanta. We're here at the National Center for Civil and Human Rights. I am here with State Senator Tanya P. Anderson of Lithonia. And one, I want you to start actually, tell us a little bit about yourself, what led you into the, into the legislature. So I have um, been in public office since 2006. I started out as a city councilwoman in the city of Lithonia, and then became mayor in that same city. Um, 2012 was elected to the House of Representatives, um, got sworn in in January 2013, and now I am a state senator. My district covers Lithonia, Conyers, Covington, Oxford, Porterdale, and of course the new city of Stonecrest. Got it. So you proposed legislation to uh, make it easier to expunge record, the criminal records uh, in Georgia. Tell us about that. So this bill came about um, by um, went to a conference and was, we, we bill share at conferences and we talk about the bills that we pass in our states. 
And so I got the idea from a colleague um, in, in Philadelphia. But what this bill does is it restricts um, or expunges uh, records for people who have misdemeanors and um, some nonviolent felonies. Anything can, be, I will say, there are categories that can't be um, um, restricted or expunged, and those include um, any sexual offenses and um, some domestic violence um, disputes. So this um, bill allows for people to, after four years of having a clean record, um, to uh, petition for their for their um, records to be expunged. So right now, as we're learning, it's uh, if you have a criminal record in Georgia, you, life gets really hard, even if you've paid all of the debts of your sentence. Like as a legislator, you've you've seen this. Like also as a mayor. Yes, as I have, I've seen it at every level, which is why I introduced myself the way that I did because I've seen it at every level. Even when I'm out, I'm in the community. People want to know how can you know how can you help me. And it, it just became such a frequent conversation until I decided that I needed to look into it so that uh, people could have, you know, their, their life back. They could have a second chance. And even, as you said, even after they pay their fines, have everything all lined up, they're ready to go, it's still there. I had a um, gentleman come, well, his daughter came to committee and testified that, you know, father wanted to purchase a gun in his 60s. He went to purchase a gun and something that he did in his 20s was still there and he had no knowledge of it. Um, so it does not ever leave your record. So this is an avenue to allow people to, to clean their record, get back to work, because people really want to, you know, provide and care for their families. This will also boost the economy um, in Georgia, but it will also help people with housing, as well as um, anyone who wants to go back to school. So I noticed, like, as I was looking at the, I mean, it was nearly a unanimous vote. Yes. Like, this wasn't even particularly controversial. No, actually it was unanimous all the way um, around. I don't think people fundamentally understand how much of an outlier in a lot of ways Georgia is along these criminal record things. There are uh, like four out of 10 Georgians have a criminal record. Mm -hmm. Something like 5,000 out of every 100,000, one out of 20 people is either in prison, on probation or on parole right now. Well, I, I say Senate Bill 288 is a start. What else needs to happen is that we have to put um, programs in place for people to have um, the um, resources that they need in order to um, be prepared to go back to work and, and go back to, into society at another level um, of, of a decent salary, of a decent minimum wage or working uh, living wage rather. Um, just, just put programs in place that will allow for that to happen because people are desperately wanting their life back and wanting to get back to work. That is the kind of insight that makes a conversation like this valuable. You're exactly what we needed. I'm glad that you were able to come here. Thank you, Senator. Thank you so much, George. You're watching The Next Atlanta. I'm George Cheedy, and we're here at the National Center for Civil and Human Rights. I'm here with Dr. Vicki Crawford, who is director of the Martin Luther King Jr. Collection at Morehouse. Yes. Uh, Dr. Crawford, thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. Will you tell me a little bit, uh, tell, start first with, describe the work that you do right now. Well, as director of the Morehouse King Collection, I am a part of the curatorial team, which is here at the National Center for Civil and Human Rights, where we curate rotating exhibits of Dr. King's papers. Uh, there are over 13,000 items in this King Collection, and they reflect many of his iconic documents, like the Nobel Peace Prize lecture, the Nobel acceptance speech, uh, many of his famous sermons, uh, the last sermon that he delivered before he was assassinated, and um, lots of wonderful documents that really speak a lot about Dr. King's thinking and philosophy, but as well as major events of the 20th century and the major campaigns of the 1960s. So part of what I do is help to curate those papers. Uh, I'm involved in public education and trying to bring um, the work of Dr. King and the work of the American Civil Rights Movement to the public. Uh, and we're doing this uh, in public education. We're doing it with uh, educators in uh, college, on colleges and university campuses. Uh, uh, and uh, with the community at large. King's famous speech. He is referencing, among other things, Stone Mountain. Um, the uh, And I happen to live near Stone Mountain. It's fascinating. There's a lot of talk about what to do about monuments in general, Stone Mountain in particular, uh, which I think is a tough nut to crack 
Eight Ways to Sunday. Um, at one point, they were talking about putting a monument of some sort, a, uh, a token, a remembrance, something of King on the mountain in order to reconsecrate it. I don't exactly know what they were thinking exactly. Um, I'm curious about your thoughts on King and Stone Mountain and what might what path forward you think we should be taking around these these monuments? Well, this discussion, this this sort of national conversation, if it is, uh, around uh, monuments, most of them monuments to the Confederacy and monuments to white men who espouse white supremacy, uh, they are bound in this country. We know now that there are over 1,700 of these monuments that still exist, so they're quite plentiful. We also know that many of these monuments were not erected during the time period, during the era of the Civil War, or shortly thereafter. They were erected in the 1920s and later during the period of Jim Crow segregation. So, um, you know, the monuments are symbols of, of, of something, and so, should they come down? Should, should you change Stone Mountain? Uh, I think that I would say some of these monuments do need to come down. Most of them need to come down. Um, and, and in place of those, I'd like to see a conversation around what needs to go up. Uh, there's so much, uh, so much rich African American history, Native American history in this country. Uh, there's so many people that we ought to maybe consider to erect monuments and uh, memorials to. I'd like to see us move in that direction and have that kind of a conversation. One of the arguments against pulling the monuments down is that you will quote, "You're destroying history," and um, I personally think that that's a little weak because history needs to be taught. Like you take a book, you read it. Um, I'm concerned about what history education looks like in general. And um, this is an area of subject matter expertise for you. Yeah. Uh, I, can you tell us how should we be learning about the history, both of the Civil War and of the Civil Rights Movement? Well, I think we should have some required courses. Uh, required material in the curriculum in uh, K through 12, where we begin to teach the history of the civil rights movement and that, that goes way back, the long civil rights movement, not just the 50s and 60s, but uh, decades that precede that. We need to be teaching that uh, in K through 12 and introducing it early. And we need to be having these conversations with young people and sharing some of the lesser, the, the history that is what we call hidden history. Uh, and not just the sort of sanitized version of this in the outline form, the cliff note form. We need to dig in deep. And this is tough. I mean, because you're going to have to have some difficult conversations and raise some questions, but it, it's so relevant because the, as we're seeing now in this present moment, as we see that, you know, we're still a part of that trajectory, we're not done with this. And so we're squarely in the middle. So when we teach that history, both, you know, on the K through 12 level and in, in college, we're investing in the future uh, and for generations to, to come to, to some understanding of, of, of this past. The monuments in general were raised, as you said, like years and years and years after the Civil yes. War. My understanding is that the United Daughters of the Confederacy raised them in part to mark the territory that white supremacists had recovered after the war, to say, in effect, it's okay to lynch someone here. You're not gonna get in trouble. That's why it's on the courthouse steps. Well, I think, again, here again, uh, the history of these uh, monuments coming to be uh, is a history of them coming to be in an era of segregation and white supremacy, and that they serve that purpose, okay? The propaganda of that, of uh, entrenching that um, white supremacist kind of thinking into the culture. Um, I, I think they very much come, come as a part of, of that. Some municipalities have chosen to be progressive on that and move forward with taking them down. Uh, I understand Mitch Landrieu, shortly after the massacre at Mother Emanuel in Charleston, he took the, the lead in taking down some of these Confederate monuments in uh, the state of Louisiana. Uh, and there have been other, you know, places where, where the governments have said, local governments have said, we're going to take these down. You know, th these don't, these no longer serve the purpose for which they, they thought that they were served. We're not going to allow these to be here. Let's say we started blowing up all the Confederate monuments that we find, um, and we wanted to replace them with 
civil rights figures. Who comes to mind? Well, I'd like to see if, uh, Ella Baker, a monument or a memorial um, erected to uh, some of the women who were involved in the civil rights movement uh, and people like Byatt Rustin, who organized the 1963 March on Washington, a gay man who um, at the time was, um, you know, he organized that march. You know, he was not the person out front as a spokesman. Men, but he was certainly uh, very instrumental uh, in the success of that of that march on the mall. Uh, those are just two people, but I'm sure there would be a whole list of, of people that communities would come up with whose names that we don't know or lesser known who should be honored. Uh, there are people here in Atlanta that, uh, no doubt about it, Atlanta student movement uh, that should be, you know, there should be some tributes to them and what they did, did in this local community. It's interesting to use the word honored uh, because that strikes me as the purpose of a statue or a monument is it's less historical education than a public honor is that fair well do we need do we need statues or or, or is there are there other ways that we uh, keep we we keep history alive dr. Crawford I'm incredibly grateful thank you very much for coming that was exactly what we needed thank you for having me Clear our criminal justice system needs to be reformed. Black people are disproportionately affected by mass incarceration. Not everyone receives good and fair legal representation. Some minor offenders are receiving severe punishments. And in a way, some of those offenders are punished for the rest of their lives by the stigma of being incarcerated. And as for the Confederacy, forgetting about it is not an option. But we do need to address where and how that history is preserved and presented. As we end this episode, we've also reached the end of this series. So now it's time to reflect. What's next for our city and our country? Right now, people are still taking to the streets and demanding change. On this show, we've tried to shine a light on some of the issues many of those protesters are advocating for. Should the police be defunded? Furthermore, who's actually policing the police? We've talked to real people and real law enforcement officers to get their views. And we've got a historical perspective on the tactics used by the activists who came before us. What can we learn from the civil rights movement and the men and women who set it in motion? These are all questions we've presented to you. You have a responsibility to be informed and a right to be heard. We want you to take action. Use what you've learned. We've posted several links on the Next Atlanta page on fox5atlanta.com. There, you can watch all of our episodes and see how to get involved in your community. I'm George Cheedy. Thank you for watching the Next Atlanta.